Today, Spotlight On brings you an exclusive interview with film director, producer and author, Tony Clare. Hello, Tony. Hello, Liz. Nice to meet you. After all this time, it's finally a chance to get to chat with you with all these talks between me and Richard. I'm really looking forward to this. Yeah, well, Richard is, I have to say, the emperor of introductions. Um, yeah. And he does seem to be able to find a bit cool for his pickle. <laughs> Yeah, he joined the dots. <laughs> yeah. Right, well, what we're we'll going to do is we'll start from the beginning. Just a basic question. Where were you born and what were your roots? Uh, I was born in Hackney in London. Uh, in, uh, a Jewish boy born in the Salvation Army Hospital. Um, and my father was the son of Polish uh, immigrants. My mother, the daughter of Russian immigrants. And so oh. I'm two generations away from being Polish or Russian. Uh, but very happy to be British. Um, and the, my dad was an engineer um, originally after school, uh-huh. and he uh, got into, by chance, a reserve deck occupation. And uh-huh. that meant he was not allowed to join up. And I was just telling somebody about this uh, the other day. He, I didn't know until he passed away and I read the obituaries that he volunteered for the services 11 times and got arrested the last two times because you're not allowed to do that if you're in a reserve occupation. So he was an interesting character who went and, and found his way into eventually becoming a film producer. So uh, that was my roots. Your roots there. So what came first with you, directing, producing or writing? Um, writing. I, I, what happened was that I, when I was a small kid, we moved. My dad was very upwardly mobile, as, as you might have guessed, and... So we started off in, in what was, we lived next to a bomb site, um, and it wasn't, wasn't very salubrious. Uh, and then he got us to uh, Masonet in West Acton, and then on to uh, greener pastures in the suburbs of North West London in Stanmore. And there, at that school, they put me, they took me from, a, from a, a very, very tough school, Catholic boys' school in Acton, into a private school. It was the first time I'd ever met people like that. And in that school, they wanted you to do anything you were good at. They encouraged you to do things. And they entered me. They thought I was good at writing essays and things, uh, compositions. Yeah. And so they entered me into a couple of competitions. Uh, they showed you a film about uh, chocolate they were making. One was from Nestle and one was from Cadbury's. And they showed you these films about how they made the chocolate, I guess. And... You had to write an essay about it. What you, I don't know what, I can't remember the exact connotations of that. And yeah. I was fortunate enough to win one of the national competitions and tie for first place in the other one. And the prize was pretty much as much chocolate as you could eat. And a visit to oh, there you go. And I was sold. That was it. Films, writing, that I was in. <laughs> Except I was eight years old, so I didn't know quite how to go about it. And, and so writing was the first thing. Film was so, related to that, and, and, yeah. and it followed from that that I wanted to find a way to do, to make my own films. Was working on the UK TV series The Avengers your first contribution to the entertainment scene? Uh, no, I, I worked. Uh, my first things I worked on. Well, first of all, my dad made me. He wanted me to go to, go to university, and right. I was. And, and I didn't want to. I wanted to go to work. And he said, well, you can take a year out. If you don't succeed in that year to establish some kind of credibility, then, then you go to university. And if you do, then you can stay out for another year. And I'm still out for the other year. <laughs> I, what happened was I, I got a job working as a, like a gopher. You know, a gopher is go for that. Yeah. Uh, we were a company that made films, or took, like training films for the RF and the Navy, and also yeah. you know, general stuff. Uh, so we did refueling in flight on Vulcan bombers and lightning jets taking off from trainers and going minesweepers at sea. And it was a fantastic, wonderful experience for a kid. I was like yeah. 16, 17. And because I was very energetic, you know, if somebody was ill or something, I just said I could do it. I couldn't. I didn't know what I was doing, but I learned how to do things. And so within that year, ended up being, you know, like a unit manager, uh, you know, running little things and sending crews yeah. off and 
ended up working a little bit on the BBC, um, did an assist editing job on a play, a Wednesday play, which then was on the BBC once a week on Wednesdays. And then that led to going on as an assistant director on films, which got bigger and bigger. And at the same time, I started, and, and TV shows, and at that same time, when I was on The Avengers, which was for about a year, I was uh, borrowing the equipment with my then colleague, Mike Litton, who was working on another series there called Randall Hart Kirk Deceased. Um, we yeah. borrowed the equipment, and on the weekends and night times, we were making our own little films. And that's how it started. Oh, it all started. So tell me about um, Extremes, and there's a little story behind this that I found out. Something about £600 in the group. Oh, it's true. Um, yeah. We, this was our third little film, and we had finance from a proper distributor of financial by this stage. And not a lot of money, but a little bit. And uh, we then had the task of, you know, we never have enough money for music, and, and I, I'm a music lover, so I always was very, I, I, wanted, I had very rich taste in very poor pockets. And, <laughs> and, 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 the, and the boss of the company that was financing it was a distributor. Uh, it was a gentleman who didn't have similar tastes. In fact, he didn't think we needed any music like that. Uh, why don't we use just library stuff? And he said, well, no, because we need like, music that fits. And so yeah. I went uh, with my colleague and we went all up and down Denmark Street, you know, Timpan Alley, talking to all the publishers about what they'd got and what we could listen to. And eventually, amongst them, uh, one of them said, I've got this, some unreleased tracks that these people have done. And he played them to us. I said, well, yeah, that, we want that desperately. And he said, well, you have to get the permission of the bank because you know, they, don't, they don't give out any permission for anything ever. And they're kind of difficult. And so we said, OK, can I come and see the film? We did a rough cut at that point. And they, they said, yes. But it, it, like the first three times we arranged they didn't turn up or somebody was ill or somebody was just absent. And eventually the fourth time they came and they looked at it and then they looked at it again. And they said, right, we're getting the right vibes, we're going to do this. And they were very nice and agreed to do it. And I think we got, we paid them like £300 for the right yeah. to use it on our film. And then uh, the, the manager rang me up about a month or two later, and he said, before the film came out, and he said, you know that, that, that group? He said, they've got a real problem. They've got a man who says he's going to fund them, but had, the money hasn't come through yet, and they're going to lose the van. They've got no transport, and they drunk it. So if you can come up with another £600, you can have half the publishing for those tracks. And I thought, well, this is the best deal ever because the tracks were sensational. And so I went running with my friend Mike to the boss of the film company and said that we could have this for another £600, you can have half the publishing, and it's the best deal ever. And he threw us out. And needless to say, that group was super tramp, and they were tracks that went on to become part of Crime Century. Oh, man. What a, what a sickening that was. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's easy in hindsight, but I must admit, we did get it right. We did know. I mean, it was so obvious to us that these people were super talented yeah. and they had something special. But he didn't see, he didn't even really care. It just, like, wasn't what he was going to put money into. Yeah. I don't think he ever yeah. regretted it. <laughs> no, no. Would you like to tell our listeners about the butterfly ball? Yeah. Uh, well, that happened... Um, uh, it, 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 the, the music was by Roger Glover, who was uh, from Deep Purple, and yep. they, they asked us if we would be able to put a film together based on, on the Butterfly Ball, with the book, you know, Alan Aldrich's book, which is a wonderful poem. And, yep. you know, we thought that was a wonderful idea, and everything was going great, and we agreed on everything. It was all going forward beautifully, and then uh, <laughs> it's a normal film story, the day we were doing the rehe dress rehearsals for the concert part of the film, uh, we had a budget of I think sixty something thousand pounds, which was quite a lot of money in you know early seventies. Yeah. And they said, uh, by the way, we need to call you into the office, in the, and they take the office over in the Albert Hall where we were going to film it. And I said, okay, so I go rushing in there because I had thirteen cameras that still out and all that kind of stuff. And they said, yeah, you know, um, the poetry. And I said, yeah. They said, well, you know, that Vincent Price is going to be reading. I said, yeah. They said, you can't film it. I said, what do you mean? <laughs> they said, we haven't got the rights. It hasn't been cleared, so you can't film it. 
I said, but how are we going to do the butterfly ball without the poetry? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> exactly. He's sitting there, I can't avoid him with my cameras. And they said, well, that's problem number one. Problem number two, they said, you know the budget? I said, yeah. <laughs> Thinking, oh, God, what's coming next? And they said, well, you haven't got £60,000. You've got £16,000. I said, no, you mean you've reduced it by £60,000? They said, no, you've got sixteen. We haven't got the rest of the money. Yet. It's not available to you. And like an idiot, I carried on because I figured I'd employed all these people. They yeah. didn't know them, they knew me. And I felt uh, impelled to move forward with it, which is a mistake you make when you're young and you don't know uh, and yeah. inexperienced. And so I tried to go forward making the film, which we did make, uh, for less than one third of the budget that we previously had. So, for example, the lady that we were going to get to do the costumes was the one we'd done tales with Beatrix Potter. And we ended yeah. up going to a fancy dress shop. <laughs> and the ballet sequence that was going to be rehearsed for a week, we could only rehearse for half a day, etc., etc., etc. And so the, I, I wanted to reduce the film to a 16 minute film from a 19 minute film and make it really just a concert. And yeah. they said, no. They said, you've got a contract here that says you're going to do a, a 19 minute film and distributor. They agreed, 19 minutes. So you've got to make a 19 minute film. So really, it was very uh, dispiriting for me as a creative person to go forward. Yeah. The only thing I think that works in it is the music and certain yeah. parts of it, the staging, which were, were really good. Uh, but, you know, the minute you go into trying to do something for one third the price, you've got a problem. And and now I would be the first to say, stop. <laughs> stop, <laughs> yeah, don't go there. Yeah, but, you know, no. you, don't, you don't know that when you're a kid. Yeah, no, the music was brilliant, wasn't it? It was Deep Purple. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, well, I did, I did a lot of work with Deep Purple. We also made a film uh, called uh, Made in Japan, Deep Purple Rises Over Japan. And they called it different titles yeah. in different places, which was basically yeah. a concert film in the Budokan Stadium in Tokyo. Um, and that went very well. That was fine. But it was a very conventional uh, little documentary, really, yeah. just a concert film. Uh, and they were, I think, at the, pretty much at their peak music at the time. And they, yeah. you know, I've, I've been lucky that I've worked with bands and musical people that were the best in the world. Um, and that you know, yeah. helps. <laughs> well, I'm that, that brings me to my next question, because um, one of my favourite rockumentaries is one of your major ones, The Kids Are All Right. Yeah. That's brilliant. Now, um, I know that you, you knew Roger from a previous production, but how did uh, The Kids Are All Right come about? Well, as you say, I, I made a, a, my friend David Courtney, uh, who I'm now doing a thing called The Show Must Go On With, uh, a musical yeah. theatre piece, which comes uh, out next year. And when yeah. we were, he introduced me to Roger Daltrey, who he was doing the One of the Boys album, uh, which is Roger's, I think, first solo album. Yeah. And uh, it, that was going very well. And David recommended me to Roger and, and vice versa. And so we met and got on, and I made the uh, video for it, which is then called a pop promo, I think, and we made it called One of the Boys. And that at that time, this is pre-MTV um, in America, yeah. uh, they used that as a, as a mini second feature to Star Wars when it first came out. And so it got enormous exposure, and um, that helped me, <laughs> sold me to them, I think. And... So yeah. they asked me, would I be interested in making a film with The Who? Um, and I was. And that was my field. I mean, I was into music and I was into working with bands, et cetera. And clearly yeah. that was very successful at the time. And so they asked me to work out a way of doing it. And, and that's how it started, a, a, a very nice uh, request, which I was happy to fulfill. Now, um, what was it like working with Tim, uh, Keith Moon? And <laughs> did you find it harder to complete the film? Because he, he passed away during the film, didn't he? Or did he pass away just after? He passed away just after we filmed it. What happened was I ended up having a huge row. I was originally slated to write and direct. I ended up part writing and producing. Because All right. the way that Townsend and, and Dorkshire were fighting and yeah. the rest of the band. And so part of that was that we had to work together. And, and Jeff and I... Um, we later had terrible fights, but you know that doesn't stop you making a good film. And what happened was 
we sat down and we were planning the schedule. The original schedule, he was going to be filmed, Keith was going to be filmed last, you know, individually, yeah. we did each section. And we both looked at each other and said, you know, we'd better do him first. Uh, we just both knew he wouldn't, wouldn't make it. Um, yeah. He was, you know, clearly um, wrecked by all his excesses. And, you know, it's a sad truth that we were unfortunately right. Um, you know, he was irrepressible uh, through the filming um, in a big way. Yeah. Uh, and he was enormous fun. I have to say that of everybody that was there, he was like a force of nature. I, I kind of liked him the best uh, yeah. because he was true to himself and his own madness. But uh, it doesn't stop him being like a, like a big kid. He was like a big kid. Yeah. He, wasn't, he wasn't harmful. He could do harmful things, but didn't make him... He, 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 his motivation wasn't harmful. Uh, I, I really yeah. loved him. But he, he would do things that were very difficult to deal with. Um, but one time, he was coming... We were on the beach at Malibu by his house, which was next to Steve McQueen's house, and yeah. Alan McGraw. And he... And his roadie, who's a friend of mine, Google, you know, a uh, butler... And he, 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 they saw Sidney Rose, who's our executive producer, and they just, for fun, just dumped him under the ocean and were holding him. And I could see it was going to be, a, you know, too long. And eventually spotted to the surface where they, you know, they, they, they let him up. And he had the whole uh, petty cash money, you know, many thousands of dollars in his pocket. And the next thing I saw was we were filming him drying with a hair dryer the money. <laughs> <laughs> And then I saw them, Keith coming towards me on the beach, and I had fortunately managed to secrete about my person uh, half of a of a pork ear. And I said, yes, you can do it, Keith, but I'm going to hit you on the head with this if you do. And he was fine. He walked away. And he never, tried, never troubled me again. Um, <laughs> you know, he, he, was, he was everything you imagined. The one time we were on the uh, balcony of his house, and then we were just chatting, and he had a big snifter of brandy, like a big one. And we're talking, yeah. and two beautiful California girls went across the beach, in, again, yeah. and he's waving to them, and they're waving to him, you don't know who it was. And they're yeah. about, it was about a 30 foot drop, and he just jumped off the balcony with the glass in his hand. He didn't spill a drop, and then we then started chatting him up as he, as he got up. Oh man, it all real. <laughs> oh, for real. I mean, he did this stuff for real. Another time, uh, it's my fault, really. Uh, we had a, a film, a birthday party for him, at, to put in the film, uh, a place called Trancasset yeah. on the Pacific Coast Highway. And, yeah. you know, that it, it turned a bit wild because I had a, a, a stripper come out of a giant birthday cake and he got a bit overexcited and the young ladies in the place got a bit overexcited and the men who were with the young ladies got even more excited. And so it was all getting into mayhem and the place got wrecked and out the pile lot of money. The next day, but in the meantime, he took off because he was a bit unmanageable, and he had Liberace's, uh, you know, the like, like pianist. He had his Excalibur car, and, oh. and, and this vast thing, <laughs> and he took off down the Pacific Coast Highway, and then came back for some reason. And he said, "Come with me, Clinger." <laughs> I jumped in the car, and he jumped. He drove down the wrong side of the Pacific Coast Highway. For a good few miles, people were flashing, going mad, police cars, and then they recognised and they let him do it. And he didn't get touched. And we, he, he, he drove me back, and I said, oh, like, I realised I'd allowed him to drive me. That's like insane. But it's just, that's just three or four of the stories. I mean, he, he was, that, that, all the, the legend about him was true. He was, he was insane. Yeah. That's it. Tell what we're going to do now, Tony. Um, we're going to have a small break. Yeah, we're going to have a small break for music. And we're going to play some of the tracks from um, the films you're associated with and also the books you're associated with. And we'll be back with you in around about 15 minutes' time. Okay, super. Hello, and welcome back to part two of this exclusive, brilliant interview with director, producer, and writer, uh, Tony Klinger. Welcome back, Tony. Thank you very much. Some great music, thank you. <laughs> I love the who. I love the who. Right, um, let's start. Yeah, my favourite movies, and we're going to start with my favourite film. And now I've been, I've been, well, how can I put it? I've been wanting to tell the listeners about this secret. All right, 
think I found out about it from uh, Richard about two two months ago. But I'm going to let you tell him about it. All right. Now I think you know what I'm going to say here. Um, let's shock some Geordies. Where was the first place considered for filming the film Get Carter? And what are your memories of it? I think it was Hull, or Grimsby. <laughs> Grimsby, I. <aye. laughs> oh, man. You, know, you, you just broke loads of Jody hearts there. They were going out. Grimsby? Oh, well, what, man? It's going to Newcastle. Of course it was. <laughs> 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 I think it's up that, up and up the way. So, what are your memories of this, that film, um, Get Carter, when your dad was uh, directing it? My dad produced it. My dad was a ah, producer, it, sorry. Yeah, yeah my, my, uh, a very wonderful director called Mike Hodges directed it. Uh, uh, yeah. What happened was the book called Jack's Return Home, the original book by Ted Lewis, uh, yeah. landed on our desk. Um, what used to happen, uh, what still happens with me, but in those days when we were working together sometimes, uh, people, publishers, people like that, would send us the material before it went out um, so that we could see like, what's called the galley proofs, you know, the, the, the third version of it. And... You know, sometimes we'd get something that would excite us as a family. You know, <laughs> you know, you'd get there and you'd go like, oh, well, you all want to read this. And we only had the one copy, so we like, were tearing it apart, literally, and every one of us read it in the same day, I think, uh, you know, for wow. us. And what then happened was, it was one of those things that sounds unbelievable in, in today's world, is that from the day that we found the book to getting the director to signing up Michael Caine, to finding the locations, to making the film, to the day it was premiered in Newcastle, it was 37 yeah. weeks. 37 weeks. It's okay. unheard of. Yeah, it just, it just happened. Everything just fell into place. It was meant to be. The film was meant to be. Uh, yeah. it, and it's, and everything about it was right. And Newcastle, and I'm sure everybody realises it, became like a character in the film. It, it's so important to the film. You couldn't have made that film anywhere else when you look at it you realise that was the place I had to be. Uh, and it was a special place. And I remember when I came up there, I, I, I was making my own film at a time called Extremes, which we talked about earlier. Uh, and we were supposed to be going to Glasgow. My old man said to me, he said, why don't you come in to Newcastle on your way, because you've got to go kind of past it to get to Glasgow. You know, why don't you come in and spend the night and you know, meet everybody and you know, be, be around for a day. Yeah. And... That day spread into more than a week because we had the best time. <laughs> we, we were every club, every young lady. We had the best yeah. time. And in fact, we filmed uh, Newcastle for my film as if it was Glasgow. <laughs> and we never told our fine. We never told our fine out so We never got third in all. <laughs> uh, I know. Um, it was, just, it was just, an unusual time and place. It just was something special. Yeah. What I did do, I did uh, tell Frida Payne about um, a track band of gold, what, what you told me about. Yeah. Uh, you know what she said? Uh, she goes, what? Oh, that's, that's really that's really nice. That's good. I'm like, <laughs> I'm going, yeah, yeah, I know. But uh, all I did was the dance floor weekend to it. Yeah, <laughs> if, if, if any of you listening to yeah, if, if, if there'd be a mum or a grandmum now, <laughs> if you get <laughs> ah, yes. house, in that house that I was in with Mike Litton, uh, in, the, in 1970, I guess it was, um, yeah, I'm sorry that you misbehaved like we did. <laughs> it's, it's time I said sorry. <laughs> it, uh, it, was <laughs> it was great, man. I tell you, it was brilliant times. Uh, tell us about the man who got Carter. Well, what happened was... Uh, when my dad died, which is now, he died in 1989, and, and yeah, that shook me to the core, because he was not only my dad, we spent three years working together at that stage, and he yeah. was my best friend. Um, and I kind of went into, I think I had a bit of shock, uh, you know, that uh, it can happen to you, a bit of depression. Felt like he was still there, he was an enormous presence. A lot of people felt like that about him. Yeah. And then I thought it's a kind of just a let it go. It's going, you know, just you must not waste your time thinking of the past. You've got to be moving forward all the time. And, you know, so I kind of put it to the back of my mind. And then as time went on, people kept talking to me about him. You know, everybody that, that was in the business or people that seen his films, they all had something to say. And 
the next thing I did was I gave all the archives uh, to the University of the West in England, and they made this huge yeah. study about him because he was the most successful film producer in, in, in England for about 15 years in the late 60s to the late 70s. And yeah. it was became evident there was like a, a groundswell of opinion that you know maybe we should re-examine this man and what he did for independent film production. And then I thought, you know what, I'm coming up to the age he was when he died. If I don't do something about it now, I never shall. And so I decided I'm going to make a film about it. And not just as a film producer, but as a man. He was an incredible man. And I thought I'll put it together and see what happens. And, you know, <laughs> it'd be a very personal film. And the man got cast as a very personal film. But it, you know, I was fortunate enough that people reacted to it exceedingly well. And it's moved on from there. It's sort of got a life of its own now. It's going to festivals and things like that. And hopefully it went out to distributors and things like that uh, yesterday, in fact. <laughs> so it's very, very yeah. recent news. Um, and it, we'll see what happens. But I'm just proud that I got to do it uh, because I felt, felt it was uh, a necessary thing. And it's a love letter, uh, basically, yeah. I suppose. Uh-huh. Yeah, but you know, if you can't love your own dad, it's tough. <laughs> so I'm very yeah. lucky I did. Well, I've got some news for you. Um, you know, we were talking about I was going to bring Carter back to Newcastle. All right? Yeah. Uh, things are almost in position, all right? So uh, I'm going to, I'm telling you now because we're, we're going to be blab blasting this out on the old radio, um, but by the time this goes out, we'll have a date and a, a venue for it to be in Newcastle. Oh, that's fantastic, me. That's wonderful. I know. I know and I'm just hoping that the certain person who I've been chatting to doesn't sort of uh, give me that, the, the old missable phone call, but yeah, that's on the table there. So yeah, we're going to be in Carter back in Newcastle. Oh, that would be fantastic. So, uh, I love, it, I love it to young people get to see it as well because I think yes, yes, yeah. well, it's, 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 it's a cultural, cultural thing. thing. Yes, uh, we talk about people today about Get Carter, and even the teenagers today know about the film. They know about the locations. They know about the ferry. They know about the car park in Gateshead. So it's. it's well, I had this in I had an extraordinary thing that happened to me when I was originally talking about you know like we get getting to a rock up stage of the film. And I took yeah. the subject from the BBC. And they said, you know, we love everything about the sound of this film. We like the subject. We like what it's about. The one thing we don't like is the title. Why have you called it that? I said, because that sums him up. You know, the man who got carpet. It sums my dad yeah, up. The and they said, they said, well, nobody knows that film anymore. They said, it's like, you know, what, what are you doing? And so well, I put out on LinkedIn, I put out, do anybody remember this film, Get Carter, or have seen it? We had 483,000 responses in four days. That's phenomenal. Yeah, it, I mean, that yeah. shows... And so I, I sent that to the BBC. I <laughs> said, so who wins the argument? <laughs> well, you know the BBC's like, man. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, he won. Guys, now, um, I understand you're making a new uh, piece of musical theatre. You know what we talked about earlier on? The show must go yeah. on, where sure. you wrote and the, the music from David Courtney. Do you want to tell That's us more right. about that? Yeah, yeah. Well, David and I have worked together over many years in different projects. And yeah. in fact, we, we're together doing uh, the Essex Walk of Fame right now. Um, he, he owns all the fame things, and Essex is one of the places we work, which I've had an input on. And a little while back, he said to me, Something I want to put on, you know, about my life and my music, and he said, no, I, I want you to write it. And I, I thought about it because it's, it's a big undertaking to do something like this, as you know. Uh, but then I sort of thought of his story, which I know very well, and it's extraordinary. And and then I, I, I re-listened to all his music, which is also extraordinary. I don't know if you know this; he sold something over thirty-two and a half million records that wow. he composed or produced, and. You know, that's, that's, a, that's a big number of records. And when I started to play the tracks for people, to just test it out, even young people uh-huh. go, oh, wow. You know, and he's worked with, you know, and made careers with people like the OSA and Roger Daltry. He's had Eric Clapton work on stuff with him. He's, you know, he's, it's, a, it's a who's who kind of thing. And yeah. an extraordinary story because of his relationship with uh, the late Adam Faith, who I call Terry. Mm-hmm. And 
Adam kind of managed David, and you know, he, Adam was a rough diamond. The first words out of his mouth to me when I first met it through David uh, was, "You can't trust me because I'm a completely selfish bastard." That's his first sentence to me. Uh, and then every time he wanted to do business with me, I would remind him of that first sentence and say, no thanks, Adam. <laughs> and, and so the, the story is basically how it centers around how David discovered Leo, Sarah, and, and yeah. as kind of his Svengali, and then behind him as his Svengali was Adam Faith, and then all the things, were, you know, the, the dirty dealings that went on. Um, and amongst that, this incredible music and show-stopping, uh, you know, reactions to it around the world. And yeah. you have, uh, a, I think, what could be a magic formula. And so we yeah. actually started workshopping it, and uh, we just sort of appointed a director and a producer, you know, the things that you have to have, choreographers and musical directors, yeah. etc. And so the workshopping and the first uh, you know, little kind of performances, readings and that kind of start in the new year and we'll develop, hopefully we'll end up in the West End, have a long that take. I mean, it's a big long process, but it's, I think, a very exciting show. It's proper musical theatre, though. It's, not, it's more Blood Brothers than you know, one of these uh, uh, jukebox kind of shows where it's just songs. Yeah. It's, you know, it's actually got a proper story. Um, yeah. And... Incredible characters. I mean, these really are incredible characters. Otherwise, I don't think I could have written it because it would just be to me boring. But it's certainly not that. And it's got the best title ever. What show's got a better title than the show must go on? It must go on. Yeah, exactly. And, and I like Lewis music. Uh, I also have done. I've got a question for you now. Um, who was your favourite star you have ever worked with? Out of all of them, you've worked with literally hundreds of musical yeah. uh, singers, singers, groups, and uh, actors. But well, who's your favourite of all? My favourite has to be, uh, and it's because I just admired him so much, Lee Marvin. Um, Lee Marvin. Lee Marvin, uh, he just was a, a proper film star, a real proper yeah. film star. Uh, my second favourite would be Michael Caine. And my third favourite would be Roger Daltrey. Now, you know, people are saying Lee Marvin, why Lee Marvin? You actually produced, or were you assistant producer on Shout at the Devil? When you, uh, Lee Marvin, was, was that correct? That's what they call now a line producer. So I was line producer. Yeah, yeah so that's the per, uh, associate producer. It, that's the person who executes the tactics for the strategy that the producer has outlined. Yeah. So uh, you just you've got to make it happen. And so they get. They, yeah. You're not the person who says here's eight hundred of million dollars. You're the person who has to spend. Those dollars yeah. and make sure that it works out right. So that's what I was doing with that. Yeah. So, yeah, you mentioned the worst. The worst person I've ever worked with. Oh, that's a tough. The person, <laughs> who, the person who let let me down personally in a big way, I felt, is Roger Moore. Um, I I I don't have any time for him, and a lot of people would be very surprised by that because he was handsome and he was charming. He told great yeah. stories. All of that, but I, I thought it was full of, I won't say the brown stuff, but you know what I mean. Um, yeah. And I, I just, I, I, I didn't enjoy what he did, and, and um, I had nothing really nice to say about him other than... Sure, you know, that was a film in gold, wasn't it? He was in gold, yeah. actually. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't, I don't question his abilities, uh, you know, such as they were. That, yeah, yeah. That, I'm talking about him as a man. I'm talking about all four of those people as as they are as men. Um, yeah. You know, I, and you know, I know Ellie. people are feet of clay, and I'm not saying I'm perfect, but I just, I just, yeah. I, I just thought he let himself down with us. Yeah. But some some people like that, you know, they they, they will let themselves down and they'll think something else, and then before you know it, it's it's, it's finished it and it's and everything's spoiled. Yeah. Now I. Earlier, you told me a couple of funny stories about uh, yourself and the antics of Keith Moon and The Who. Have you got any other funny stories you want to share with our listeners, um, either with the uh, Keith Moon or anybody, somebody different than these? I've, I've got a lot of stories. <laughs> well, one, <laughs> yeah, one, well, no, we can talk about Another one with Keith Moon was he'd upset Steve McQueen big time uh, because he'd turned up on the, uh, the Queen had a bedroom on the ground floor by the beach, you know, literally on the beach. Yeah. 
uh, with Ali McGraw. And because they were pissing each other off, excuse me, what the language. And that's uh, all right, it's okay. What then happened was that uh, I think there was somebody else involved as well, but Keith turned, came out of the street in a, in a fog suit, which he took off, and underneath it he had a Nazi uniform on. And he was standing outside of it, giving him the Nazi salute. To the Queen because he didn't he thought the Queen was an actor. And the Queen yeah. had it in his mind to kill him with a shotgun. <laughs> <laughs> and and <laughs> so we were now filming and the Queen was getting progressively more upset with the idea that we were filming and that we might film him or Alan McGraw. And it was getting to the point where we almost couldn't film because you know, he wasn't the man you want to upset when he was at that stage of his career. And so <laughs> I figured I'd have to go next door and sort him out <laughs> one way or another, make it make make it work out. And so I went and <laughs> Alan McGraw answered the door and she was lovely. She was a delightful woman, lovely to look at and very pleasant. And she said, Come in and have a cup of coffee and we'll talk about it. And I did. And then he came in and he, he just was he looked like he was gonna kill me. And so I had like I don't know, I must have been there two hours trying to talk him into it would be okay, don't worry about it. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> he's, he's really not that bad. I promise I'll keep him under control. And he let he let it he let it ride. I think he I think actually he went somewhere else. He had he bought the house next to him to knock down to make yeah. more space so there should be nobody there. And then then Keith Moon arrived. So can you imagine he wasn't happy? Who's your next door neighbour, Keith Moon? <laughs> yeah, you know he want peace and quiet. And the other thing with Keith was that he would. Like as a kid, he was, he was like a like a kid. On the one hand, he he was getting well. I I I wasn't responsible for it, but I kind of colluded, I guess, by not stopping it. Uh, he yeah. wanted me to go and get uh, the money that was that was owed or something from Universal uh, Studios. And I said, well, what? I said, what is this? Well, like, he said, it's going to be in there, Don't worry about it. I said, I said, Are you. Like getting me to be like your drug guy. I said, because I'm not doing that. And he said, no, 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 it's not easy. That's money. They owe me the money. It's my cash. You know, I want it. And he said, I know you're going to be there tomorrow anyway, so just, just ask for it and I'll give it to you. And they did. And I thought, I'd better count it. I don't want to be the person who they say one figure at one end and another figure at the other end. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it was $30,000. And so... How much? $30,000. And wow. I went with it to... Um, the uh, give it to him, and I know yeah. that they bought with it uh, the Colombian marching powder, <laughs> and it, you know that much, and that's a lot of Colombian marching powder if you've got that much money in yeah. it. And wow. he did a lot. He did a lot in in a week and a half. Did a lot. Uh, well, him and his friends, obviously. And then he would have to take uh, brandy. He would he drink like a bottle, bottle and a half of brandy in the morning to bring him down. He had to get some sleep. So it was like it was like a wrecking ball. You can't you can't keep doing that. Yeah. Well, it was yeah. a, a train crash going to happen, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It's bound to. Yeah. You can't carry on. It's going to going to get you one way or another. I'm not saying that killed yeah. him. But that was party to what killed him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so that's right, the uh, other side of it. No. But he's still he's still a great lad though. Oh, but have anybody? What's your next book? And when's it coming out? Well, I've got this one you have power at the moment called Under God's Table, and The Hill and I, yeah. the second edition of my book about making a film with The Hill. And oh, I have another one called uh, The Butterfly Boy that comes out as the second edition next year. And then I have a series of books that are set in very different in the 17th century in London called the Al- Our Sasha series, the Our Sasha chronolo- Chronology. And and that will be not to the end of next year. So I have a whole bunch of books. So I, I, and I, I also write scripts. So I spend half my life locked in a room writing, and the other half out trying to hustle and get them done. So it, it's a busy life. So a very, very busy month in the next couple of years. Yeah. Well, I tell you something. We've got some new listeners uh, to the station, all right? And a lot of people know you, and some don't. And... What I'd like to put there now is, if somebody wants to find out more about uh, you and your projects, what you've done and what you're going to do, is there any way specific they can go to to find out more about you? Sure. Sure. www.tonydklinger, 
which is Tay dot com. Yeah. Uh, so right. Well, I'll do it up with Alfie. And it's, 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 it's Tay, not C, and it's a D in the middle between Tay and Tay. And it's Con. Tony. Yeah. It has been a real pleasure chatting with you today. Honestly, it has. I've been so much, man. It's been a I've enjoyed it enormously, and I look forward to seeing up there with you in Newcastle in the not too distant future. Yeah, well, if it all goes to plan, it'll be we'll be looking at about February. Oh no, never March, March, April time next year okay. when it comes about, and it's going to be in the actual Newcastle city centre, and where you can where it's, where it's going to be. Hopefully, I can't can't speak to the venue yet, but if you look down the bottom of the street, you can actually see the Town Bridge. Oh, it's fine. Fingers crossed. I know, man, it's going to be brilliant. And you, you can come up with uh, Richard and bring a real with you as well, and we'll have a good time. Right, once again, thank you so much for joining me, Tony, on Spotlight On. It's been absolutely brilliant. Many thanks for that. And, and I said, please, don't, don't, don't pick the 24th of March, because I'm in Bristol, that day with a screen in Bristol, but any other time would be fantastic. Just really fantastic. Okay. Stay where you are, Tony. Don't go away. As we close down, and I'll come chat with you. Okay. Many sure. thanks again. Thank you. Bye bye now. Bye bye.